Open up your Bibles to the book of Romans, and we'll be picking it up in chapter 13 this morning with part 5 of our review of the book of Romans, and we only have uh, one week left in this, and, and then we're done, I promise. <laughs> Everybody's like, I don't know, I don't believe you. So, uh, as a Christian, in the world that we live in today, how should I conduct myself? Now, this is a serious question these days because there are many voices that are trying to shape and reshape the conduct of Christian people. Christian people should believe this. Christian people should act like this. Christian people should think this. Christian people should not think that. And there's many, many voices that are trying to mold and shape the conduct of Christian people. And, and some of those voices are, are very compelling. You know, Christianity needs to change. It needs to evolve or it's going to die. And there's lots of people that are saying that today. And there are many sides to the discussion. Some... Uh, advocate for a more liberal Christian worldview, some uh, for a less liberal Christian worldview, and it's very easy for us to throw out the tried and true answers of, you know, if I was to ask you, how should a Christian behave? Well, you know, we're supposed to love each other, you know, and we're supposed to act like Jesus. And we all know that. We all get that. And then we have to go out and try to do it. And that's where things get a little dodgy. Because when, when the rubber actually meets the road, outside of the theoretical, and this is the theoretical in here, things get different out there. There's conflict out there. And, and we start thinking a little bit differently when all of a sudden we're confronted with something that we didn't actually talk about in church. You know, it's like, or, or, you know, if any of you you went to college and you got a college degree and then you went out and got a job and it's like, whoa, they didn't tell us anything about this in class. Well, you know, oftentimes, just like in college, our education begins when we leave the classroom. And sometimes in Christianity, our Christianity begins outside the doors of the church. It's easy to behave good in here, isn't it? It's easy to love each other in here because we're all so doggone lovable. But then you go out there, and, and then, yeah, it's only an hour. <laughs> I can behave good for an hour. <laughs> I said that to a friend of mine one time. I'd known her for a long, long time. She'd never been married. And I said, you know, you're, you're such a nice person. How come, how come you've never been married? She says, you only know me for an hour at a time. And I said, good point. <laughs> So we get out there in the world and, and then all of a sudden we're confronted with having to make decisions about things and, and, and all of a sudden it's like, okay, well if I say this, then this person over here is going to yell at me. But if I say that, then this person over here is going to call me names. And if I say this, then my spouse is going to hate me. And if I do this, then my family is going to disown me, right? We start seeing the consequences of our actions, and, and if we really want to go out into the world and behave like a Christian, then we start saying, whoa, you know, this may cost me something, or this is harder than, than what I thought, and, and on and on it goes. So if I call myself a Christian, if I say I've been born again by the Spirit of God, and I'm a Christian, how should I conduct myself in this world? Now, we're in part five of our, our review in the book of Romans, and we're now at a place in the book where all of a sudden, it's almost as if Paul's vision goes from uh, being so inwardly, our, our inward uh, relationship to Christ, you know, back in chapter 12, you know, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. And, and we think, wow, you know, that's intense, that's deep, that's, that's something that I really need to work on and I really need to understand that. But, but there's a hint of where he's going. Uh, back there in chapter 12, verse 2, and we get to it in chapter 13, because in verse 2 he says, do not be conformed to this world. And then we get into chapter 13 all of a sudden, and we found that we, we find that, that all of a sudden uh, the faith that we say that we have, this, this new creation, this new life that we say that Christ has given us, we have to now take that and turn it outward. 
We're really good. We're going to talk more about this uh, in the new year. We're really, really good at taking our time. Well, I think we're good anyways. At taking our time for the self-examination. We're really good on what we, what we might call doing the autopsy on the old man. You know, uh, we're really good at examining how we got here and why we are the way that we are and what Jesus wants from us, what Jesus has done for us. Okay, that's good. But now we got to turn it outward. Now it has to go out into the world and outside of the church. Now, something that you guys all know is true. This world has for centuries and now as much or more than ever, and I pay a lot of attention to this, the world annually, now daily, trots out a list of Christians' worst behaviors and why Christians need to change. And if you're not paying attention to this in various forms of news media, it's every single day. I'm not kidding you. If you like, I can provide you with a list of stuff. And what they do is they, they try out the list of Christians' bad behaviors, how Christians need to change, and then they club us over the head with it every single day. You know, your, your faith is going to die. Your faith is divisive. You, when you say the things that you say, and when you believe the things that you believe, it makes you narrow-minded, it makes you ignorant, it makes you stupid. That's what they tell us every day. There are people in the news media every single day, I see them every day, that even suggest that faith in God is a form of mental illness. One very well-known Atheists suggested that if you teach religion to your child, that child protective service should come and take your children away from you. Because you're, you're imparting to your child a form of mental illness. This guy sells millions of books. And lectures all over the world. And then, in addition to that, the facts and figures from dozens of polling organizations reveal a truth. That while people in America are generally spiritual, an ever-increasing number are relativistic in their faith. Now, you read just about any poll you like, and you'll find anywhere from 75 to 85% of people in America believe in God. And, and my usual thinking is, if that many believe in God, how come their behavior isn't any better? We can talk about that today. But they're relativistic in their faith. In other words, they say, oh, yes, I believe in God. And you might even be able to... Uh, to and kind of pigeonhole them a little bit more and, and extract a little bit. Yes, I believe in the God of the Bible. Yes, I believe in Jesus. Yes, I, I believe, you know, in the, and they'll give you stuff. Like, but then when it comes right down to actually doing it, that's when things begin to break down just a little bit. You, you've heard me ask this before. You know, okay, ask 100 people. When is it okay to lie? Well, you're going to get a lot of answers, and the most common answer you're going to get is, it depends. Right? Is that what people say? When is it okay? To lie? Well, you know, that depends. It's situational, right? Situational. Well, for a lot of people, their faith is situational. Depends on the If they're in here, they're all for it. They're, I'm, I'm all for for faith and everything like that. But then you put them in another setting, and now all of a sudden you'd never guess that they had any kind of faith in God at all. Anybody who has a more absolute view like, for instance, I believe that the, God is, that the Bible is the inerrant word of God. And it's authoritative for all things pertaining to life and faith. You say something like that, and now you know what that makes you? That makes you an extremist. That's, that's the new scarlet letter, isn't it? You're an extremist. And you know, it, yeah, if, that, if that's... And the funny thing is, is the things that I believe that the Bible is the word of God, it's inerrant, and it's an authoritative for all things pertaining to life and faith, that used to be the norm. So is it that I'm extreme? Or is it that everybody else is extremely relativistic in what they think and what they believe? So then, how is a Christian who is trying to live on the basis of Christ inside the Word of God filling our minds and the Holy Spirit enabling us, how are, how are we then to interact with the world around us? How's that supposed to happen? Now, while many would come up with various alternatives uh, to the rules of Christian conduct, seems to me, we'll see, 
Uh, Romans chapter 13 and 14 kind of heads us off at the pass and says, okay, well, you want to know? Here it is. Okay, so point number one for you note takers. I got four things for us from our review in chapters 13 and 14. Uh, point number one is Christian conduct towards the state. Romans chapter 13, verses 1 to 7. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore you must be subject not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. For because of this you also pay taxes. For they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. Render therefore to all their due. Taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. The role of government in the day that we live in is debatable, <laughs> to say the least. And, and you know me, I don't, I don't talk about politics here in the pulpit. If you want to talk about it, we'll talk about it after church. But from here in the pulpit, I want to be all about Jesus. Well, sometimes he's got something to say about government. And one of the things that we discover about government these days is that everybody's got a different opinion about what it ought to be. What form should it take? What's government supposed to do? What's government not supposed to do? And, you know, the Bible doesn't really address that. The Bible simply says that God sets a standard for not only what human government is supposed to be, but a Christian's relationship to it. Now, as we discussed when we went verse by verse through chapter 13, God created human government. God appoints authority in the world. But God cannot be held responsible for what humans do in those positions of authority. Because God may put people in positions of authority, but it's up to them to fulfill that responsibility or to not fulfill that responsibility. And, and, and ultimately... God doesn't really address that at all in his word, other than, you know, whoever's a leader, they're going to be judged just like the rest of us in the day of judgment. Now, what does God's word say then about Christian people and our relationship to government? Well, first of all, the Christian, of all people, the Christian understands the necessity of being subject to leadership. Now, we all chafe a little bit at leadership, and some of us more than others. I, I was great in school. I loved school, as long as they didn't make me do anything. <laughs> now, as long as I got to do what I wanted to do, I was fine. I took a photography class one time when I was in high school, and the photography teacher said, okay, you know, I want you to do this, this, and this. And I'd already been into photography for a long time. My dad got me into it because my dad was into it. My dad built me a dark room out of my garage. He taught me how to shoot. He taught me how to process my own film, how to print my own images. And so I go to school, and, and the guy says, okay, I want you to do this, this, and this. And I'm like, man, I was doing that years ago. And so I did this whole thing on ultra super macro close-ups of vegetables and flowers that I found out in the yard and printed them all big 8 by 10 glossy images and I brought that in. And he failed me. And I'm like, dude, these images are great. And he says, yes, but it's not the assignment. I'm like, but the assignment's dumb. I did that for all seven years of my high school career. No, it was only four years. <laughs> no wonder it took so long to get out. I finally discovered the secret. We understand, though, because God's in authority, right? God's in authority. God's not a school teacher. And God's not just like one of our parents. God's God. And when he commands, we have a responsibility to obey, and he's going to hold us accountable for that. Mm -hmm. So we, as Christians, we understand authority and the necessity of authority. Now, here in the United States, 
This is somewhat complicated. Now it's complicated in that we get to elect our governing officials and we get to vote for the laws that we live under. Now, that means that sometimes the things that you vote for win. Sometimes they don't. And if they don't, then you still got to live underneath them anyways. There's lots of things that are the law of the land here and I don't like them, but I still got to live underneath them. Now, when the Apostle Paul was writing this letter, uh, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, what, what kind of government was Paul living under? He was living under what was actually a brutal military dictatorship. Underneath one of the most bloodthirsty seizures of all, Caesar Nero. And he says, you need to be subject to the governing authorities because if you're not, you're going to get into trouble. And that trouble, man, the, the government's got a sword, and they got a sword for a reason. You know, there's a reason why the, the highway patrolman has the little ticket book. You know, when we, when we, when we go too fast, we, we get a ticket. So if I obey the laws of the state, then I have no conflict with the state at all. If I live in obedience to those laws, and if I don't like a law, or if I don't like a politician, then I can vote for something or someone different. I have that right here in the United States. But, again, that doesn't mean that, that you know, my guy or my gal is always going to win. That doesn't mean that the laws that I want are always going to pass, and a lot of times they don't. But I still have to live with those laws, and I still have to live with those leaders, whether I like it or not. And what is my response supposed to be? I'm supposed to live in subject, being subject to the governing authorities. Now, my worldview, how I see the world around me, and I believe this should be true for every Christian, how we see the world around us is built upon God's word. The reason why I vote for this or vote for that, the reason why I vote for or against something or someone is because I have a worldview that is derived from God's word which is the foundation for my morals from which spring my ethics. So God's word supplies my foundation. That's where I derive my morals, and from my morals come my ethics. I am bound by God's law to obey the laws of the land insofar as I am not commanded to disobey the Lord. Now, if I'm commanded to disobey the Lord, well, I'm going to have a conflict. Turn over to Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5, in verses 26 to 33, and as the apostles were out preaching and teaching, <coughs> they came into conflict with the state and specifically with the religious authorities of the day. And that was in a day and in a time when there were religious authorities. And they had authority. And at some time, they actually had the authority to execute those that disobeyed certain laws. In this particular time, they did not. The state of Rome did. But now when you get down to uh, Acts chapter 5, verse 26, then the captain went with the officers and brought them without violence. They're bringing in the apostles before the Jewish Sanhedrin, for they feared the people lest they should be stoned. And when they brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, Did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine. <laughs> There's something that we ought to make as a goal for the city of Half Moon Bay. And you intend to bring this man's blood on us. But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. Him God has exalted to the right hand to be the prince and savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins, and we are his witnesses to these things, and so also is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. Now, the U.S. government has not commanded me to stop preaching. They haven't told me to stop preaching yet. yet. And, and, and until they do, I, I can freely continue to do that without fear of the government at all. Now, there's plenty of countries in the world, and I've been to a few of them, where if we were to gather together like this, we would all be in danger of being arrested and going to prison. And I, as the pastor, would be in danger of extended stay in prison with possible execution. There's many, many countries in the world like that today. There are many countries in the world today where if you convert out of the religion that you were born into, they'll kill you. 
You know, I was born into this particular religion, and but I don't want to be that anymore. I want to believe something else. You cannot. You'll be executed if you do. Isn't that nice? In this country, we're okay. We're okay here because we can believe whatever we want to believe. You can be as relativistic as you want, as liberal as you want. You can be as atheistic as you want, and it's okay. And we can all get along just fine. I got no problem coexisting with anybody that wants to believe anything. But when you tell me that I cannot preach in the name of Jesus, when you tell me that I cannot gather together with others that believe the same thing, when you tell me that I can't say these things publicly, well, then we're going to have some conflict. Now, what are we supposed to do then? 1 Timothy chapter 2. Let's zoom over there. 1 Timothy chapter 2. It's easy to find because it's right in front of 2 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. So what are we supposed to do then? Well, we're supposed to do what we do here every single Sunday. Therefore, I exhort, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, let's notice something about this little passage here. Okay, we're supposed to pray for those that are in positions of authority. And we do that. We do that here every single Sunday morning. You hear it from the pulpit. We pray for our president, and we pray for the cabinet. We pray for all those in elected, and lately I've been made aware, uh, praying for those in appointed authority, too. Because there's lots of people that govern in seriously <coughs> high positions that are not elected at all, but they are appointed, specifically judges like the Supreme Court. We need to pray for them. But you notice how in 1 Timothy chapter 2, this section on praying for those in authority puts it in a different context. And what is that context? Verse 4. God our Savior who desires all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. This is interesting. Notice how God's word puts evangelism at the heart of civic duty. Isn't that interesting? If we live lives above reproach in the public square, then people will be saved. Now, we err when we disconnect civic duty and evangelism. Because the purpose of living the way that we live in the public square is to lead people to Jesus. That's why we do it. We do what we do the way that we do it to lead people to Jesus. Now, what about them? What about those people? You know, the others? What are we supposed to do about them? Point number two. Back in Romans chapter 13, Christian conduct towards our neighbors. Uh, Romans chapter 13, verses 8 to 10. Owe no one anything. It's a good law right there. Owe no one anything except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, are all summed up in this, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of a law. <clears throat> Great passage. All we have to do then is love others. Right? That's all we got to do. It's easy. Right? Simple. Just go out and love others. Piece of cake. It's so easy. All we have to do is what Jesus said. I just love the words of Jesus. You know, he said to love everybody. And if we would all just love everybody, then the world would be a much better place to live in. Oh, yes. Yes, it would be. Yes, all we have to do is love each other. Turn to Luke chapter 6. <laughs> love each other. I'm supposed to love the Seattle Seahawks. Okay. <laughs> Luke chapter 6, in verse 27, Jesus says, But I say to you who hear, are you listening? Because Jesus is talking. I love to you. I say to those, uh, say to you who hear, love your enemies. 
and do good to those who hate you. And bless those who curse you. Pray for those who spitefully use you. To him who strikes you on the one cheek, offer the other also. And from him who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who asks of you. And from him who takes away your goods, do not ask them back. And just as you want men to do to you, you also do to them likewise. But if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. <laughs> oh boy. Lots of people love each other. Lots of people that aren't Christians love each other. Atheists love each other. Atheists love other people too. But Christians haven't cornered the market on loving each other. You don't have to be a Christian to love somebody else. But you do have to be a Christian to love somebody like this. I read Matthew or Luke chapter 6, verse 27 to 33, and I can tell you quite honestly, you come to my house and you try to take something from me, I'm not going to let you. <laughs> you want to hit me on one cheek, I will not let you hit me on the other cheek. In love, I will restrain you. I will stop you from doing that. And I might even take a shot at you, but I'll only wing you. I won't aim for center mass. I'll aim for a shoulder or an arm or a knee or something like that. Hope my aim's that good. And yet, Jesus is asking us to love in a way that that I don't know. You know, Jesus is not necessarily asking us to be a doormat. He's not asking you to leave your doors unlocked and invite all the burglars of the world in to steal all your stuff. He's not asking necessarily for that. But he is asking for a generous and a sacrificial, a self-sacrificing, unconditional kind of love that we are to show to other people. See, our love, and most people's love, is conditional. Even the kindest person that you know, you start ripping them off and see how they, they, see how they treat you after that. You know, they might love you for a little bit, but boy, after a while, they're done with you. You know? Jesus is asking you to love unconditionally and sacrificially. Right? How you doing on that? If, if, if Luke chapter 6 here is, is our model... For that kind of unconditional and sacrificial love, <clears throat> how are we doing? And, and you know, I got to tell you, in all honesty, I know I'm the pastor and everything, but I, I don't do real good at that. I am not good at that. I freely confessed here to Deb here just the other day. I am a selfish person. I am not afraid to tell you that. I am a selfish person. I like getting my way, and I don't like it when I don't get my way. When the Dr. Pepper machine is out at in and out they got the little tag hanging on the fountain there that says, you know, temporarily out. I don't like that. I don't like it when I don't get what I want. Well, how does God love you and me? It's how God loves us and this is how we are commanded to love others. God, see, God demonstrated this love Romans chapter 5, verse 8, God demonstrated his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus died for you when you couldn't have cared less about Jesus. And I know you're saying, okay, that was 2,000 years ago. But it's the principle. There was a time in your life before you were saved when you didn't care about Jesus at all. Oh, maybe you believed in him intellectually. You said, oh, yeah, Jesus, of course, yeah, yeah of course. Yes, Jesus, great, great guy. Wonderful guy. But then you're born again. You're born again by the Spirit of God. And something happens. Something happens. Because you realize that in the depths of your rebellion against God, in the, in the depths of, of your, you're not even caring uh, about God and, and who he is, Jesus loved you so much that he died for you and that he would do it again. If it was 2,000 years ago, he would do it again for you. 
And if Jesus was to be born into the world today, he'd still die for you. It's interesting because that passage of Romans chapter 5, verse 8, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And what, is, what does that mean? Well, that means that uh, God loves us unconditionally, but he does not approve of everything we do. That's where the sin part comes in, right? So Jesus loves us unconditionally, but he does not approve of everything that we do. You know what that makes his love? Think about this. It makes his love convicting. Convicting. Have you ever, for those of you that have joined us this morning that are Christians, and I think I pretty much know everybody in the room, and I think you are, have you ever done anything really dumb? You, you sinned before God, and it was blatant, and it was ugly, and it was stupid. And then God blessed you. And then he blessed you with something. And what was your reaction? Did you say, oh, thank you for that, Lord. I, I deserve that. Thanks. It's about time you got on board. No, nah, no, nah, you didn't do that. You went, oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. The last person in the world that deserves this blessing is me. It's convicting. It's convicting for the love of God to overwhelm you at a moment in time when you realize that you least deserve it. And yet, that is how he loves us all the time. He loves us that way all the time, whether we deserve it or whether we don't, because you know what? We don't ever deserve his love. So his love is convicting. I wonder what would happen if we loved others that way. <coughs> To love them sacrificially and unconditionally while not approving of everything that they do, but to love them with that sacrificial and unconditional love that says, you know what, I, I, you, know, you know me, I know you, you know that I don't approve of your behavior, the things that you do or whatever, but I love you, man, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless you. Oh, and sometimes, you know, I think our, our I don't know, I could be wrong, uh, we think our, our mindset towards the sinner is, I just have to keep telling them they're sinners. And if I keep telling them they're sinners, then ultimately they're going to get the idea that they're a sinner and they'll stop being sinners. And, you know, I just don't see that here. I see a sacrificial, a self-sacrificing, unconditional love for people in spite of their sin while not approving of it. Why are you doing this for me? Because I love you. Well, do you approve of... You know, the fact that, you know, I'm a serial adulterer. You know, I've committed adultery on my wife five times. No, don't approve of that at all. But I still love you unconditionally. Don't approve of your lifestyle. But I love you unconditionally. Wow. I wonder, I wonder how people would change in response to the way that we love them. If we love them like that. We see that same thing in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Are you being convicted this morning? I hope so. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I like what Greg said the other evening. I'm watching this video. It says his job to uh, comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> 2 Corinthians chapter 5, starting down in verse 18. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Think about that. Our ministry, given, given to us by God, is to lead others to him so that they can be reconciled to him, just like he reconciled us. Now, and it, that tells me a lot about my job. That's my job description. Uh, go and preach the gospel and rec ministry of reconciliation and love others as, as God loves me. That is, verse 19, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. You can be reconciled to God. Yes, you've sinned. Of course you've sinned. We all have. But you can be reconciled to God. That's how much he loved you. That in spite of what you've done, he is ready to receive you as his own and to transform your life. And as we like to say here, and God's word bears this out, God loves you so much, he's not going to leave you the way that you are. You're not going to live the rest of your life a serial adulterer. You're not going to live the rest of your life as a serial liar. God's going to convict you of those sins. And God's going to transform you at the same time. That's reconcil reconciliation. Now then, verse 20, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. And that's what God's doing. He's pleading with the unbelieving world 
through those of us that are believers. And I cannot help but think that sometimes the message gets a little tweaked as it's passing through. Because it's as coming through me, you know, my weirdness kind of gets in the way sometimes. And sometimes the message, it doesn't come out quite, you know, it comes one way from the throne and then it comes through me and I got I to gotta tweak it a little bit and maybe I need to stop that and just let the purity of the message just come through me, the purity of who God is and his love for us. Yes, God does not approve of, of, of our sin, but he's ready and he's willing to reconcile us to himself like that. And that's the message. And that's the message. And this is what we show our neighbors. Christian conduct is fundamentally evangelistic in character. We behave the way that we behave. We do what we do the way that we do it. We say what we say. We don't say what we don't say. All for one reason. To lead other people to Jesus. In all the things that we do, we want our neighbors to see Jesus. Not just see our good behavior. Think about that. Think about that. We don't just want them to see our good behavior. We want them to see Jesus. Because anybody can behave good for an hour. <laughs> anybody can behave good for a period of time. But we want them to see Jesus, not just our good behavior. Does that make sense? Okay. So what does the world see in us and from us? Not what do I want them to see, but what do they actually see? And I'm afraid sometimes it's not real good. And, and we're victims oftentimes of the popular media who wants to paint us in a particular picture. You know, when the Westboro Baptist Church shows up to, to, to uh, boycott or to protest at a homosexual funeral or at, a, at a, uh, a soldier's funeral or something like that, the media paints us with the same brush stroke as them. Now, I cannot judge their souls. I can't do that. Only God gets to judge their souls. But I can look at their behavior and say, you know, I just don't see that kind of behavior in God's word. I just don't see that. Sometimes there's little or no distinction between the believer and the non-believer. Believers get lumped together in, with really unsavory characters that we don't want to be lumped together with. The worst witnesses of all that the world can find, they do that to us. And sometimes the best thing that the world can discover Sometimes the best thing the world can discover is that we are not what they thought we were. When they actually sit down and have a reasonable and a rational conversation with somebody who's biblically literate and says, look, you know, this is just simply what I believe. Well, I disagree with you. Eh, it's okay. It's okay. I disagree with you too. We'll agree to disagree. And we'll do so agreeably. Wow, what a concept. When they see God's love from him through us without getting tweaked by us, that's convicting. That's convicting. And then people are going to say, what is it with you? What is it about you? Well, this brings me to point number three. And point number three and four are short. But number three is Christian conduct towards other Christians. Uh, that's uh, Romans chapter 14, verses 1 to 13. Receive one who is weak in the faith, but not to disputes over doubtful things. And then he uses the example of things like uh, vegetarianism. Uh, you know, for one uh, believes he may eat all things, but uh, he who is weak eats only vegetables. <laughs> yeah. I didn't write that. <laughs> Don't don't shoot the delivery man. I just you know I just telling you what it says. This is the carnivore's favorite verse in the Bible. Uh, so I don't I don't know what to tell you. But you know obviously it's what the Apostle Paul is talking about. Is he talking about issues of faith here? Issues of faith whether you eat meat or vegetables on the basis of faith. Well now here's my point on this. We really need to kind of lighten up on each other because. Um, Quite honestly, Christians have been beating each other up for centuries uh, over really secondary and even tertiary issues. Uh, we, we divide over the silliest things, and, and oftentimes the things that we do divide over really are, are not. There, there's plenty of things that are worth fighting over. 
Look, if you if you say that you believe Jesus actually uh, was a human being, that you know he wasn't really God in the flesh, that he wasn't born of a virgin, uh, but he was a really really great guy, nevertheless, you know what? I'm going to divide over that. You know, I, I disagree with you, and and so you know that's what you want to believe. Uh, you know, then you're free to believe that. I don't. So there are things that are worth fighting over and things that are not. And, and liberties, so-called Christian liberties, are one of those things. And they're, they're just not things that are worth fighting over in, in my estimation. You, you want to meet on Saturdays instead of Sundays? Go ahead, knock yourself out. Uh, you want to use you know, guitars instead of organs in church? Far out, go ahead. Uh, but if you want me, or if you want to judge me on the basis of your rules and regulations, forget it. It's not going to happen. If you want to meet on Sundays instead of uh, Saturdays instead of Sundays, great, go ahead, knock yourself out. But if you want to judge me as being less of a Christian than you because I meet on Sunday, well, we're gonna have an issue with that because it's just not worth dividing over some things, and some things are. If you want to look down your nose at me because we like to use musical instruments in church and you don't, well, I, I can't help you then. Because I'm not going to live underneath your rules and regulations. Why can't we just keep the main thing the main thing? And the main thing is Jesus. And that's what we want to be about. We want to be about Jesus. Jesus said that the world would know that we are his disciples by the way that we love each other. John chapter 13, verse 35. Now, he says something again that I've been touching on here all morning. I'm going to touch on it again. In John chapter 13, when he says that, um, he says, by this all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Did you note the, the evangelistic element in that verse? <coughs> what is it? By this all will know, all will know, all will know that you are my disciples. The way that we treat each other in church, the way that we love each other in church, then the world around us is supposed to see that, and instead sometimes all they see is they see division in church. Well, look, honestly, there's lots of churches, lots of churches in this town, and some of them I will divide with, I will divide from them over fundamental doctrinal issues. And some of them, although we have different churches, I'm not divided from them at all. Or as I like to say, you know, the, the body of Christ is never divided. Churches are. But what do you get with different churches that all believe the same thing? You get different flavors of the same thing. Look, if you've ever been to Marianne's Ice Cream down in Santa Cruz, they don't have 31 flavors. They have like 310 flavors down there. It's amazing when you look at the wall of flavors that they have, flavors that you'd never even heard of before, you know, tuna, peanut butter, ice cream. They have everything down there. And, well, maybe not that one. But, but out of all of those ice creams, are any of those ice creams bad? Well, they might be bad for you, but, but no, they're just different, aren't they? I might not want the tuna, peanut butter, ice cream. I might go for the blueberry or something like that. Something a little more conventional. But the fact remains is that somebody's going to like it. And someone's going to come in and buy it. I don't know who. <clears throat> and there's lots of people that go to this church. And there's lots of people that don't go to this church. And they believe the same things we do. And that's okay. Amen. And we're all just fine with that. And it's not so much that we're divided from you know, one church in town or we're divided from another church. You know, we're not divided. We're all laboring for the same thing. We're just a different flavor. That's all. We're just a different flavor. I don't know what we are. Rocky Road? I don't know. <laughs> Neapolitan? It was like Neapolitan. Yeah, I don't know what we are. But whoever we are, whatever we are, we are what we are by the grace of God. Again, division on some things is very much worth it. And on other things, it's just not. Why can't we just all get along? But much of what we divide over is sometimes just so silly. And that leaves us with two more things underneath our last point. Point number four. And that is two abiding rules for Christian conduct. Two abiding rules for Christian conduct. Romans chapter 13, verses 11 to 14. And do this knowing the time that now is high time 
to wake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore let us cast off the works of darkness, let us put on the armor of light, let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, uh, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. The first rule of Christian conduct, Romans chapter 13, verse 14, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. The second one is in uh, Romans chapter 14, in verse 19. Really, it's 14 to 23, but I'm going to pick up verse 19. Therefore, let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which one may edify another. Those things by which we may edify one another. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ, edify one another. Edify means to build up. <clears throat> That's what it means, to build up. So, I want to put on the Lord Jesus Christ and I want to build you up. That's what I want to do. I want to see you walking with Jesus, just in the way that we've been talking about. I want to see you put on Jesus every day and go out into this world and conduct yourself in a manner that is befitting the name by which we claim Christian, little Christ. That's what I want to do. And whatever it is that I do, why do you do things the way that you do? Because I'm a Christian. Oh, you're not one of them, are you? Well, what's, what's one of them? I'm a Christian. I'm a follower of Christ. I'm honest. I do what I do. I try to have integrity in everything that I do. I'm honest. I try to do my job the best that I can possibly do it. In any given work situation, I want to be the best one there. Why? Because of my ego? No. Because I work for Jesus. And I want to please him, so I want to do the best that I can. That's what I do. That's why I do it. Now, if you'll pardon my gross oversimplification, here it is in a nutshell. Act like Jesus. And go, go out and act like Jesus. Go out and be Jesus to the world around you. It's kind of ironic. <clears throat> and I don't know why I got to thinking about this, but it just kind of came to me. I guess I was thinking about how we build each other up. But I thought it's kind of ironic that these days, the most common form of humor, and you know me, I'm a funny guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the most common form of humor is insulting shaming, sarcastic, and hurtful. That's the most common form of humor. And, you know, honestly, that's some of the stuff that I'm really good at. I can do that really well. And it's a bad, bad thing. Because it says there, and I wrote this down, I, you know, th there's always been this element to humor, always. There, there always will be. But look at the way that you joke with people. Who is the butt or the object of your joke? Do you try to make others laugh at someone else's expense? Do I try to make all of you laugh by cutting my wife down? I'd never do that, ever, with anyone, under any circumstance, ever. But do we do that with others? We, do, do we make jokes at other people's expense and try to, try to get everybody in the room to laugh because I was able to cut down somebody else? Hmm. How do we behave then towards those that we don't like? Do we make jokes about them? Do we make jokes about them and judgment and hell? Oh, well, well, you know, they're, they're dead now. They sure know the truth now. Do we make jokes about things like that? Or, or how is your testimony with those around you, with those that, that maybe don't even know you? They just observe you. They just watch you. They're in the same workplace as you, or they go to the same school that you go to, and they just watch you. And you don't even know that they're watching you, and they're wondering, why do you behave that way? Why do you act that way? Or, or the classic, if I was arrested and charged with being a Christian, could they gather enough evidence to convict me? Or would they haul witnesses in and say, is Brian Hemminger a Christian? And they would say, well, I don't know. I don't know, judging by the joke he told me yesterday, I don't think so. <laughs> or would they arrest me and they, there'd be a parade of witnesses to say, Brian, Christian? Absolutely. He's a man of integrity. He's an honest man. Amen. He's a fair man. He loves God. He loves his wife. He loves his family. He loves those around him. He's sacrificial in that love. Is that what they would... <laughs> I hope that... They 
not so sure that they would. Or would there be a conflict in that testimony about me? Now, <clears throat> there's an easy to see theme in all of these passages that we're looking at. One is time is short. The other is spend it wisely. It's clear in all of these things that our purpose here on earth is to lead others to Jesus. And our conduct in this world is that means or that method of leading others to Jesus. Hey, you've probably, if you've been to my house, you've seen this little <laughs> plaque that I have. It says, preach the gospel at all times. If necessary, use words. <laughs> and you know what they say, you know, if, you, if, you're, if your words aren't somehow connected with your behavior, then you're kind of robbing those words of their power aren't they? You know, you go up to somebody, yes, I'm a Christian. <laughs> you, a Christian? I don't think so. Wow. Time is short. Spend it wisely. In this context, I take that to mean there's less and less time all the time, and we best be about the work that the Lord has us to do here. Time is short, and it's even shorter now. You've spent the last hour sitting here listening to me. So we have even less time than we had when we walked in the door. Romans 13, verse 12, the night is far spent, the day is at hand. You can believe anything you want about the rapture, about the second coming of Christ, whatever. But I believe this, the night is far spent and the day is at hand. There is less time now than when I started the sermon. And this world needs Jesus. And the Jesus that it needs is not the Jesus that we make up for ourselves, the Jesus as we want him to be. It's the Jesus of the Bible. It's the only Jesus that there is. The Jesus of the Bible. Well, I, you know, I want to search for the historical Jesus. Well, he's right here. Well, I want, I want to discover who the real Jesus is. Well, he's right here. I don't have to go anywhere else to find him. But he's the Jesus that died on the cross to pay the price for your sins and for my sins. Amen. That's the Jesus of the Bible. It's the only Jesus that there is.